be good. All right. Well, I think we're ready to get to our introduction here. Our speaker is a native of Milwaukee. Um, he was, in 1976, the Wisconsin Legislature's State Assemblyman from Milwaukee's Sherman Park neighborhood. Uh, he has most currently uh, been at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee as a professor, and most most recently, he is retired from that job. But mentioned that he would not be joining us for lunch today because he needs to get back to work to work on his book. So it doesn't really sound like he's retired, but it's kind of shifting maybe a little bit. So I'd like you to all help me welcome him tightly. Thank you very much. I'm really glad she skipped over most of my biography from 1976 until my retirement. <laughs> I, I, had, I turned 70 in August and I decided that it was time to retire. There was no health reason, there was no compelling reason to do it, but I just couldn't face another year of faculty meetings. <laughs> I have to tell you that comparing a faculty meeting to when I served in the legislature with Dave Berger, the legislature, for all the reputation that politicians talk a lot, the legislature in comparison to faculty felt like an efficiency machine. <laughs> <laughs> faculty could just talk something to death and I'd be tearing my hair out. I, sometimes I'd make a motion and they'd look at me, why are you making a motion? And I'd say, we have to decide. <laughs> they'd be so surprised. <laughs> But I, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I mentioned Dave, uh, who I was glad to see. Uh, Dave uh, was a state senator from the northwest side of Milwaukee. And when he decided not to run for re-election in 1982, um, I ran for his seat and got elected. So I was Dave's successor. And then I served uh, for two terms uh, from the district that went from Mushroom Park to the old Northridge. So it was sort of the northwest quarter of the city of Milwaukee. And then um, I left politics in 1989, and um, I hastened to emphasize that when I left uh, the state senate, it was voluntary and I was not under indictment. <laughs> in fact, Charles Benson, who at the time, you remember Charles Benson, he's yes. still an anchor. Uh, on the day I announced that I was going to be in politics, asked if he would come over to interview me, and I said, sure, and he comes over. And you know, he says a chatty casual, and finally the camera person said he was ready in those days, they were all men. The camera person said, yes, I'm ready to record it. So he puts the mic in my face and said, when's the indictment coming down? <laughs> and for the first time in my life, I was speechless. <laughs> but uh, serving in the legislature was a wonderful opportunity, and it was sort of a dream, my lifetime dream, to be an elected official, <laughs> to make decisions in the public interest and in the best interest of public at large, to stand up to special interest groups. And so I'm really thankful to the voters who elected me. I, when I first ran for the State Assembly in the Schoen Park neighborhood, I was 27, uh, Ted on the young side. Uh, in, in fact, there might be people here who were my constituents. Anybody here who was my constituent? All right, there you go. I'm, I'm not asking her who she voted for, <laughs> but delighted to have a constituent there. It was a wonderful experience being in politics, and as I said, I'm really thankful uh, for the opportunity. Um, I, I'm noticing that my picture is still up on the board, and I'm finding this very disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, I wonder if you could just take it down or black it out or something. Uh, you can see from that picture that um, now I have one more forehead than when that picture was. <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Should we do this one on here? Yeah. You want that off too? That's up to them. Look, look, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Now, I understand that this is being recorded uh, for the people who are unable to attend, but uh, that also means that if I say anything that's absolutely over the edge, it will either be on Fox News tonight or MSNBC tonight, whichever <laughs> one I happen to insult. Um, <laughs> But I'm here today to make a nonpartisan presentation about public affairs. Uh, naturally, here in a church setting and anywhere I go as a professor and now as Professor Emeritus, um, I try to hew to talking about politics in a nonpartisan way. That's increasingly difficult. <laughs> but nonetheless, 
um, I, I view my assignment, of course I have my own private personal political preferences, but as a professor of government, uh, sometimes on TV, I figure it's my job sort of to be like a color commentator to a football game. In other words, I'm not here to be for or against a certain team. I'm here to try to explain some of the more complicated uh, textures of events so that they'll become more meaningful to the voters. Because oftentimes what politicians do or what politicians say is not necessarily exactly what we ought to be divining from what they're saying. So I'm, I'm pleased to be able to sometimes talk to reporters uh, uh, who, who call me from time to time. Now, I'd, I'd like to start today by, if it's for me, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> Another reporter. You know, the other interesting thing, if you notice, I, I'm guessing all of you watch the news, is that there are, if, if you're curious about um, sort of the cycles of news coverage, is there's the day shift on TV news, and those reporters come in about 10.30 in the morning, and when they arrive in the newsroom, the assignment editor gives them their assignment for the day, and their job is to do a story on that assignment in time for the 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock. So when my phone rings about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning, it's usually a reporter, usually for a 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock story. Then the second shift of TV news starts at about 2.30, they come in, they're given an assignment, and their job is to produce a story for the 9 o'clock or the 10 o'clock. And that's sort of the second shift. And so when my phone rings at 2.30, I usually know that that's a reporter. And I, I have to say that what's been happening in the news media in our lifetime is quite disappointing. Um, if only the, on TV news, the length of a sound bite. The uh, TV story used to be about a minute and a half. And so sound bites, you know, sort of, talk to a Democrat, talk to a Republican. Sound bites tended to be 15 seconds, maybe even 20 seconds. Nowadays, most stories are about a minute five, uh, and sound bites are about eight seconds. And so it, it, it's increasingly hard to actually try to compress something into those eight seconds. And occasionally, I'll run into a friend and they'll say, yeah, I, I saw you on TV yesterday, I didn't understand what you were saying simply because the sound bite was so short that I didn't get a chance to explain. And I'm guessing that some of you are real fans of public broadcasting, whether we're talking about public radio or public TV. I love doing public radio, because in public radio, you can explain. The thing, that's something you cannot do on TV. You state the opinion, but you can't explain it or give the context of it. And the other thing, of course, in our lifetimes is we've lost uh, two daily newspapers that used to cover politics in depth. Um, Dave and I remember there was a press room uh, in the state capitol that was staffed by full-time reporters uh, for the Sentinel and the Journal and there were competitors. And for Madison, there was the Wisconsin State Journal and the Cap Times, there was a daily at the time. And there was heavy coverage of what was happening in the state legislature. Now we're down to one newspaper, and that one newspaper is not particularly enthusiastic about covering government. Now, but when you think about how the First Amendment gives us all kinds of rights, the one that comes to mind standing here in the church is the freedom of religion and the opposition to an established religion in the United States. But the First Amendment also talks about freedom of the press. And of all the rights that are in the First Amendment, most of those rights accrue to us as individuals. In other words, the right to free speech is something that you bear, you can do. The right to freedom of religion, the right to petition government for redress of grievance. Those are things that each citizen holds and can exercise. Freedom of the press sort of stands out as the oddity in the First Amendment because each one of us can't be a press. Uh, yet, freedom of the press was institutionalized in the First Amendment because the people in those days viewed the press as sort of closing the circle between government decision making and the voters. In other words, how do we hold elected officials accountable based on what we know about what they've done in the term that they've been elected to serve? How do we find out what they have done? Well, we sometimes find out from their newsletters, and 
I can assure you that when I was in the state senate, my newsletters were always upbeat about all the great things I was doing. <laughs> I never talked about missing a committee meeting. I never talked about taking a controversial vote. Uh, so newsletters from elected officials are not a good source of impartial information. Freedom of the press was to give us a feedback loop that was not um, tethered to government that was not connected to government, that was not owned by government. A free press was the independent voice that told us what elected officials were doing. And we've lost a lot of that. Sure, we've gained some things from the internet, we've gained some things from being able to compare Fox News and MSNBC, but nonetheless, I, I'm sounding like an old fogey. I miss the good old days, a very aggressive, impartial press coverage of what was going on. And I'll, share just one story. It was a story about increasing the drinking age from 18 to 19. And being a relatively young legislator at the time, I remembered how in the 1960s when I was an undergraduate in Madison, and there was a draft, and there was the Vietnam War, and I remember us all saying, if we're old enough to die for our country, we're old enough to drink. And so eventually the drinking age was reduced to 18. And then by the time a generation later, when I came into politics, there was all this amorphous talk about all these irresponsible teenagers and there needed to be more controls over them. And there seemed to be sort of so many accidents with those teenagers and let's increase the drinking age. So uh, we of course had hearings, we had committee votes, and finally came to the floor of the state senate. And uh, I voted against it even though it passed by humongous margins. I don't think there were a dozen votes against it. And so the next day, the Milwaukee Journal published that roll call on the front page of the paper. Oh, <laughs> you know, it was sort of like, Repu uh, Democrats for, long list. Democrats against, Lee. <laughs> I was shaking in my boots. You know, if there had been recall in those days, this is before the era of recalls. If there had been recall in those days, I probably would have been recalled. But I probably would have worn it as a badge of honor. I stood up for a principle that I believed in, and if one had to have, you know, sort of profiles and courage, uh, of giving up one's political position for the sake of one's values, uh, I, I was ready to do it. But I was greatly relieved <laughs> that nobody suggested that I be recalled. So let me pivot to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming election, a mere six days from now, for those of you who haven't heard. <laughs> and for those of you who are praying for it to be over, uh, it would be nice to see a commercial that's not about a politician. Yeah. You know, now you turn on TV and it's back-to-back -back political commercials. The thing about uh, midterm elections in Wisconsin uh, is that we need to talk a little bit about a concept that I call the propensity to vote. In other words, there are certain demographic characteristics that are indicators, that are predictors of a person's propensity to vote. And uh, this comes from some very good political science research. And they've identified three characteristics that are in direct proportion to a person's propensity to vote. The first characteristic they've identified is age. That the younger a person is, the less likely they are to vote. And the older a person is, the more likely they are to vote. <coughs> now, I don't know the reason, but it's, it's very, very accurate and a very good predictor. And if I had to make a prediction, for all of my fellow senior citizens in the room, I would predict that there's going to be a 100% turnout of voters by people sitting in this room. Because age somehow leads to a propensity to vote. So age is one of those characteristics. The next characteristic is income. The lower a person's income, the less likely they are to vote. And the higher a person's income, the more likely they are to vote. Again, you can sort of intuitively understand how this might be um, a, a driving factor. And the third driver of the propensity to vote is education. The more education a person has, the more likely they are to vote. The less education a person has, the less likely they are to vote. So 
if we mix those three criteria together, the absolutely most likely to vote Wisconsinites are above average in age, above average in income, and above average in education. So we're talking about college graduates who are uh, leaning towards senior citizens and who have a livable income. And then on the other hand, let's talk about sort of what would be the profile, the demographic profile of somebody who has a lower propensity to vote. Somebody who is younger, somebody who has only finished high school or perhaps not even finished high school, and somebody who has low income. So those are the hard, hard to get them to vote population versus a population like yours, which is easy to get to vote. In fact, when we hear about campaigns offering people rides and offering people opportunities to help them vote, you won't need any help. I'm guessing that most of you vote, would vote in a hurricane. <laughs> and the, the only thing on the ballot would be dog catcher. <laughs> but seniors, more, more often than not college educated, more often than not with a decent income, you are the profile of the heavy voter. And the profile of the low propensity voter is in the inner city of Milwaukee. It's minorities. It's African Americans. It's Hispanics. Think of it. If uh, a person in the city of Milwaukee is a African American who is younger, who is not gone to college, or perhaps not even finished high school, and who perhaps does not have a job, or if he or she has a job, it's perhaps a very low-paying job, maybe an hourly job, maybe a McDonald's kind of job, they are very unlikely to vote. So what happens in Wisconsin politics is there's a tug and pull between presidential elections and the off-year election. We could call that the gubernatorial cycle. In fact, it was in, we used to elect governors every two years, and some of you might remember there was a constitutional amendment to elect them every four years. And when they decided in the constitutional amendment about having four-year terms, they set it so that it began in the off-year election. In other words, instead of having governors of Wisconsin and presidents on the same ballot every four years, that it would sort of give voters some counterbalance that there's the presidential election we can focus on, and then there's the gubernatorial election to focus on. And Pat Lucy, uh, a Democrat, was the first uh, governor to be elected to a four-year term. But if we look at the Wisconsin political voting pattern, comparing presidential elections to gubernatorial elections, there's a very distinct partisan pattern. Generally speaking, in Wisconsin, and there are a few exceptions, generally speaking in Wisconsin, since the time of, that President Reagan stepped down until the election of President Trump, Wisconsin always voted Democratic in presidential elections. And if you think about gubernatorial elections, ever since Tommy Thompson was elected in 1984, no, 86, ever since Tommy Thompson was elected in 1986, We've only had one Democratic governor, and that was Jim Doyle. Otherwise, we've had Republican governors. Now, what is the explanation? I think the explanation goes back to the propensity to vote. So if we're talking about somebody who is above average in age and income and education, they're going to vote automatically in a presidential election and a gubernatorial election. If we're talking about somebody who's below average in age and income and education, they're more likely to be Democrats based on the demographic uh, profile of who's Democratic and who's Republican. So, pardon me, so these below average people have a lower propensity to vote. And for Democrats to win Wisconsin in presidential races, it's a heavy lift. In other words, you're taking people who have a very low propensity to vote, and the Democratic Party just works and works and works to get them to vote. 
And up until the election of President Trump, between President Reagan and President Trump, Democrats were just able to eke out winning Wisconsin in presidential elections. In fact, if you'll recall when uh, George W. Bush was running for re-election, he spent a lot of time in southwestern Wisconsin. A lot of time in La Crosse, a lot of time in that southwest corner. In fact, I think he qualified to vote here. <laughs> he was in Wisconsin so, many, uh, so much. And in that year, they lost Wisconsin by a sliver. It was less than half a percent of the vote. So for Republicans, it must have been just a heartbreak of an election because President Bush, George W. Bush, running for re-election, came so close and put in so much of an effort. But then we come to uh, a gubernatorial election, and now those, that heavy lift for the Democratic Party to get its votes out, for the people who are below <coughs> average in most of the education, is too heavy of a lift. In other words, if you're trying to get reluctant voters, not because they're bad people, but because of sort of the circumstances of their life. If you're trying to get them to vote in a presidential election, they understand the importance of a presidential election. You offer them a ride to the polls. You offer to register them. You do as much as you can. And Wisconsin ekes out a Democratic win in presidential years un until most recently. But that layer, maybe we can call them presidential voters. In other words, they only vote once every four years because they have a very low propensity to vote. To get the presidential voters to vote not just once every four years, but once every two years, now that's a heck of a lift. And so, <clears throat> when we look back and we see how Republicans have dominated midterm elections in Wisconsin ever since Tommy Thompson first got elected, <coughs> It's a very simple explanation. Presidential voters who skew Democratic aren't voting, have a low propensity to vote. Whereas Waukesha, think of Waukesha. Waukesha, above average in income, above average in education, and above average in age to a certain extent. Those are voters who skew Republicans. And so in a gubernatorial cycle in traditional Wisconsin politics, Republicans generally win because of the demographics of the propensity to vote. Now, in, in the last two elections, we've experienced some very unusual events when it comes to this propensity to vote. <coughs> President Obama electrified African-American voters, some of whom are above average in age, above average in education, above average in income, but many of whom, because of the, I guess you'd say, awfulness of American society and the injustice of American society, many of them are below average in all those three characteristics. But the pride they had to see an African American president was enough to go against their low propensity to vote. And African Americans turned out like never before as did younger people. Remember the thing about age? If the generalization about young people is they have a low propensity to vote, Pre President Barack Obama in both of his races really shattered that stereotype. So we saw during the Obama years something was changing about our predictions of the propensity to vote. And then comes the Trump election, which is also, just like President Obama's election, a real shattering of the stereotype. Because President Trump's election, winning Wisconsin, uh, was in part because white males who did not go to college and lived in rural areas turned out like nobody had ever seen. In other words, it went against all the stereotypes that because they were uh, perhaps unskilled, perhaps farmers, uh, had not gone to college, had relatively modest incomes, but nonetheless, they were electrified by Mr. Trump's candidacy, and they voted for him, and they put Wisconsin over the top in terms of him winning the election. Now, one could give other explanations. I, I, I think it's important to say that when we're trying to interpret politics, whenever somebody gives you the glib, one-line answer, they're probably wrong. 
In politics, the results of elections are sort of like a layer cake. There are lots and lots and lots of explanations or peeling an onion. So for example, based on some research that came out of a political scientist at Madison, the issue of voter ID, of showing a valid photo ID when you vote, this political scientist, based on his research, guessed that perhaps 20,000 African Americans in the inner city of Milwaukee did not vote because they were intimidated by voter ID or did not have voter ID or feared that having voter ID might lead to contact with law enforcement or anything along those lines. Stretching, really stretching, one could try to make an argument that Trump won Wisconsin because of voter ID. I think that's a stretch. It's also a stretch for the glib conclusion that uh, Mrs. Clinton lost Wisconsin because she didn't campaign here after she got the nomination. I, I think that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. I'd like to meet the voter who said in the presidential election two years ago, well, I'm a Democrat, and I like Mrs. Clinton, and I was going to vote for Mrs. Clinton, but because she didn't come to Wisconsin personally, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump, or I'm not going to vote. Really, I want to meet that person. <laughs> but nonetheless, the uh, political class, the political reporters, the pundits you see, whether it's CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, for them this was the perfect one line, eight second answer. And I don't think it explained anything, and I don't, I don't think it was realistic. But here we are coming up on the uh, midterm election. And so the secular trend, secular not in terms of non-religious, secular trend is what uh, uh, social scientists say about sort of a general trend, the generalization. So the secular trend in Wisconsin for gubernatorial elections is that Republicans, that the electorate who choose to vote in a midterm election skews Republicans. But now comes the blue wave. And I think this is more than mere punditry. And the reason I think it's more than mere punditry is the race for state Supreme Court that happened in April. Um, if you go back over the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's always been in the Supreme Court race the de facto Republican, the sort of conservative right of center, and the de facto Democrat, who's sort of progressive left of center. And generally speaking, for the last 15 or 20 years, the de facto Republican has always won. With the exception of incumbent Supreme Court justices like Shirley Abramson or uh, Ann Walsh Bradley. Generally speaking, the conservative beat the liberal. And all of a sudden, just six months ago, in April, the de facto Democrat not only won, she creamed the de facto Republican. Now, I'm not saying that out of any partisan sense. I'm saying if you just look at the margins, it was not, she didn't eke out a win. It wasn't a fluke or a random event. She totally blew him out of the water. Now, the reason I'm mentioning it is not to take a, pardon me, a, part, a partisan position, but rather to say, I think that means that the blue wave is real. In other words, something that happened in April was not what we've seen in Supreme Court races for the last 15 or 20 years where always the conservative, the law and order candidate would win. So I think the blue wave is real. I think the blue wave is partly energized voters who are Democrats. I think it's partly African Americans who are energized. I think it's partly young people in, in the relative sense. After all, for us in our 70s, everybody looks young, right? <laughs> Or to be 65 again. <laughs> but I mean young, young. I mean 18 to 25 or 18 to 30, where all of the predictions of social science are that they would not have a high propensity to vote. They apparently have a high propensity to vote. So here we are coming into next week, the secular trend pro-Republican, the blue wave pro-Democrat. It's sort of anybody's guess. Now, I think there's a demographic in play that rarely gets talked about. 
And I think that this demographic might be the one that determines who wins the gubernatorial race and who wins the U.S. Senate race. And by that I mean Waukesha County soccer moms. <laughs> now think about Waukesha County soccer moms. Generally speaking, or don't think about Waukesha County soccer moms. <laughs> or some of your best friends are Waukesha County soccer moms. For all I know, they're your daughters and daughters in law. Generally speaking, the Waukesha County soccer mom is white. She's college educated. She is probably a full-time homemaker who's very active in the PTA of her school and in other civic events. And the, soccer, the suburban soccer moms are, across the country have generally been speaking, have been relatively conservative on economic issues. In other words, taxes. And relatively progressive on social issues, such as social justice, perhaps abortion or family planning, uh, whatever it might be. But generally speaking, when it came down to walking into the booth, they didn't feel torn, they didn't feel divided, they didn't feel ambivalent. Generally speaking, they voted Republican. <coughs> but I think those Waukesha County soccer moms who have been supporters of Scott Walker and been supporters of the Republican Party, I think that a chunk of them have become unmoored by President Trump's presidency. In other words, they're, they have a high propensity to vote because they're college educated, they're above average in income, they're probably 30s, 40s, kids in school. That in a normal year, in a secular year, secular election, that they wouldn't hesitate to vote for the Republican Party for Scott Walker and Leo Volkmeier and on down the line. But if it's true that soccer moms around the country, that the suburban, white, college-educated homemakers are defecting from the Republican Party because of either their view of the personality of President Trump or their view of the uh, policy positions of the Republican Party and of Donald Trump and the Republican Congress. In other states, in other special elections that have occurred over the last year, they have changed their vote. They have switched from voting Republican to voting Democrat. Now, uh, that segment of the population, that layer of the marble cake, of, of the layer cake, has always voted for Scott Walker. And so the question becomes, what are they thinking? In other words, one line of thinking would be, I voted for Scott Walker eight years ago. I voted for Scott Walker in the recall. I voted for Scott Walker four years ago. What's there to think about? I'm going to vote for Scott Walker again. And the reasoning on the part of that population, if, if I'm in any way catching that, would be Scott Walker is not Donald Trump. I, a college-educated, white, suburban mom, I know the difference between Donald Trump and Scott Walker, and Scott Walker is not Donald Trump, and I'm going to vote for Scott Walker. On the other hand, maybe left, left brain, right brain, maybe the other voice in their head is, I haven't been that happy with Scott Walker's second term. I was really unhappy with his views when he ran for president, and he emphasized all those controversial social issues. I see Scott Walker hugging President Trump, and I don't like President Trump, and I don't like the Republican policies, and I don't like their views on immigration or whatever it might be. I'm voting Democratic this year. Now, it seems to me that whichever narrative of these two narratives that's going on in their head right now, whichever narrative prevails is going to decide who gets elected governor, who gets elected U.S. Senator, if, um, if in the House seats that tilt Republican, if the Republican wins, if the State Assembly stays Republican, if the State Senate stays Republican. On the other hand, if they choose to vote Democratic, 
we, we might be seeing an upset of all the trends that have existed uh, in our lifetime in terms of midterm elections. So you don't need me to urge you to vote because you would vote even if I weren't here today. Uh, but I do think that the polls are relatively reflective of the accuracy of the kind of fingertip feel that all of us have for public opinion, all of our guesses about public opinion. And remembering that when we look at polls, we can be sort of misled by the precision of numbers. You know, if, if we see a poll where, let's say, Governor Walker gets 48% and Tony Evers gets 45%, and we say, oh, Governor Walker is going to win because he's got a 3% lead. Well, it's not really 48 to 45. It's the margin of error of 5%, give or take, for Governor Walker, and the same margin of error, give or take, for Tony Evers. In other words, they might be 10% apart, perhaps Evers on, Evers on top, perhaps Walker on top. Uh, they might be this close. So I, I do think every vote will count. Republicans are trying their best to mobilize their base, to electrify their base. What President Trump has been doing has been very, whether you agree with him or not, has been very logical politically. If you've heard the phrase, mobilize the base, mobilize the base <laughs> is electrify your supporters so that they not only agree with you, but they actually vote. And Democrats are trying to use the blue wave and uh, counterpart dislike of President Trump to mobilize their base. And who, who wins is really anybody's guess. So um, I, I guess I conclude by saying, them's my views. <laughs> if you don't like them, I'll change them. <laughs> Which is sort of a stereotype of the American politician. <laughs> okay, now Julia uh, suggested that um, uh, I, that there might be uh, some interest in asking questions uh, or making comments. <laughs> right. Julia, when you come up here, you can decide who to speak. <laughs> start from one side of the room. Okay, I'll start on my right. <laughs> Just so you don't think that there's any sort of impartial bias going on. Uh, the lady in front of Dave and then there. What uh, part of that layer of cake is gerrymandering? That's an excellent question. For those of you who didn't hear, I just about gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a huge issue. And I think the best way to look at it, again, not being partisan, is if you look at the election to the state assembly last time around. State assembly, 99 members. So essentially, an assembly district is like 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are pedantic, it's 1.0000 and a little bit. But every state assembly seat is up every two years. So regardless of it being a presidential election or a gubernatorial election, the whole state assembly is up. If you look over the last couple of elections that were based on the gerrymandering done by Republicans after the 2010 census, the oddity of it is that the majority of the state assembly remained Republican, but the majority of votes were cast to Democrats. And I think whether you are Democrat or Republican, I think you understand the importance of fair play that while perhaps your party is on top now, you know that there'll be a time in Wisconsin politics when your party is not on top. And you would want your party protected from unfair gerrymandering. So I support having a political <coughs> gerrymandering done by a citizens commission, by the League of Women Voters, yes. whatever it might be. <laughs> okay. But how likely is that going to be to happen? Yeah. Well, there's a yeah. Yeah, but look at the Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> Good, I didn't have to say anything. <laughs> uh, Dave, go ahead. Senator, we're getting a tidal wave of uh, advertising on TV. It's, it's just horrible. And a lot of it's like the Koch brothers have dumped in a billion dollars into Wisconsin. How is the, all of this negativity driving the, the election in your opinion? 
you know, Machiavelli said, you remember when he said this? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this yesterday. <laughs> Machiavelli said that the prince does not want to be loved, the prince wants to be feared. Correct. And I think what David is alluding to is commercials that make you fearful. Now, whatever it's making you fearful of, it's sort of up to you. Are you fearful of the caravan? Are you fearful of George Soros? You know, what is it that you're fearful of? And Democrats have their own share of fear engendering commercials. But negative commercials work, especially if you're trying to electrify the base. Every public opinion pollster who asks people, what do you think of negative commercials? People will say, I hate them and they don't influence me. But then when you look at how they vote, they influence them. So negative words set with negative commercials. And I think Dave is right that they seem to be getting worse and worse and worse, almost reminding us going back to the McCarthy era, where being in any way left of center, to be one degree left of center, you are a communist traitor. That was very effective for the Republican Party. Uh, so fear is, is not new uh, in our electoral system. Okay, a hand up, and then I'm going to swing to my left. Go ahead. Um, the freedom of the press, don't they have a responsibility to tell the truth? <laughs> I mean, if, then what's the point? I mean, if you can't, if you can't go to a source and have them be telling you the truth, I, I guess this goes to the um, the ads. Those ads shouldn't air if they're lying. I mean, who who protects us as voters? Who 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 can we turn to as just citizens to to uh, give us the truth? You know, we all grew up in an era of journalism called objective journalism or fair-minded journalism, or professional journalism, whatever phrase you want to use. It was always sort of Democrats say, Republicans say. Very balanced, very fair. Uh, now we've lost that, but on the other hand, we've gained PolitiFact. I really like PolitiFact. And I think they give it to Democrats, they give it to Republicans, they give it to everybody. And so I think that's one source. The other source is actually a libel suit. But libel suits don't get settled before an election. Libel suits get settled after an election. So for example, when Senator Robert Caston was running for re-election and Ed Garvey was his opponent. I don't know if you remember Ed Garvey. He had been, uh, I think, with the NFL. Wasn't he like the NFL? He was uh, counsel. To oh, you. That, thank you. <laughs> that, that's it. He was the legal counsel to the players' union. Yeah. Is players, that right? Yeah, yeah. players' union. Uh, and Bob Caston ran an ad saying, Money disappeared from the players union when Ed Garvey was there. In other words, saying, all but saying that Ed Garvey had stolen money. Uh, and Ed Garvey lost the election, filed a lawsuit, and cast and settled. But what was it to settle? The election was already over. So in a sense, casting was agreeing, yeah, sure, but I won the election. So, okay, I've got to move this way. Uh, yes, ma'am feel that the Democrats and Republicans are getting a little bit of audience, and there should be a chance to get an independence, uh, in, independent party out there. I mean, all we have is the choice of the Democrats or the Republicans. And if you don't like either of them, why would you want to vote? Yeah. No, <laughs> why would you want to vote? I mean, look at the election for, you know, Clinton and Trump. Absolutely neither of them should have been president. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to vote? Yes, you vote independent, and they tell you your vote is, you know, they need your vote. Well, they don't, because you haven't solved you know, uh, in, in America, our elections are binary. They're either or. Because of the way our electoral system is set up. Now, if you look at, for example, a parliamentary system. In a parliamentary system, there are Germany, France, Israel. There are a dozen parties. You go in to vote, 
and you cast a vote for a party, and maybe your party gets 20% of the vote, maybe your party gets 35% of the vote, but that means they get 35% of the representation in the parliament. Now, 35% is pretty good, but in our system, it's binary, so that generally speaking, if an independent candidate is running, the independent candidate is so unlikely to win that people feel they're throwing their vote away, even though in their hearts they believe that there should be more choice between Democrats and Republicans. So the Green Party has existed for the better part of a generation, and it gets, what, three, four, or five percent of the vote. It, it's very hard to break in in our current system. Now, it does happen in American history that parties have imploded. The Federalist Party, which, the George Washington Party, imploded by the Jeffersonians. And the Whig Party, Abraham Lincoln for most of his life was a Whig. Yeah. The Whig Party imploded mostly over slavery. And then he very reluctantly became a member of this new party called the Republican Party, which the only unifying concept of the Republican Party at the time was that they were against the expansion of slavery. That was it. They disagreed about everything else. But the Republican Party uh, then rose to become essentially the majority party uh, in American politics from around the 1860s to about Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson only won because it was a three-party race. That was when Theodore Roosevelt was running as a bull moose and was draining votes away from President Taft. Otherwise, Wilson would never have won. So I'm afraid we're not only in a binary system, but we're in a system where there's an incentive for one of the two parties to co-opt any rising voices. I think the Tea Party is a perfect example. So President Obama gets elected president. There's a backlash by conservatives. They call themselves the Tea Party. There could have been a scenario where the Tea Party would have arose as a party uh, and presumably the Republican Party you know, might have faded away, but instead the Republican Party co-opted the Tea Party, in a sense said, come with us. We have more similarities than differences. And the energy of the Tea Party really drove the win in the midterm election uh, when in President Obama's first term. So, what can I tell you? There's, that's my answer. <laughs> okay, I'm going this way. Sir, sir, and then sir. Okay. This could be a yes or no, you're going to vote, uh-uh. The electoral college is antiquated for our time and place. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, I think it's awful that somebody can get elected president based on not the majority of votes. Right. Now, you can look at, I think President Kennedy might have lost the popular vote. I'm not sure if anybody... Whip, come on, whip out your iPhone. Want to look at <laughs> there we go. Okay. So there. Al Gore and and uh, yeah. uh, Hillary. Thank you. Yeah. So there have been situations of a candidate who won a majority of the votes, right. but lost the electoral college and lost the presidency. Um, I would love to see us abolish the electoral college. Generally speaking, we have to remember that the framers, people like Madison, he, he's named after our state capital. <laughs> uh, James Madison and George Washington and all of them, they believed in a Republican form of government. Now, Republican with a small R, not, not Republican Party, small R. What does a Republican form of government, when you go back to Greece, mean? It means self-government. But you can have forms of self-government that are not mass democracy. And in fact, based on the Constitution, not just the Electoral College, but the fact that U.S. Senators were elected by state legislatures. You know, when you think of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and we think, God, what a, what a moment. And then everybody went to vote, and Lincoln lost. Lincoln, there was no popular vote for the U.S. Senate. It was the vote of the state legislature of Illinois. Uh, so gradually, the Constitution is, has been amended to make it more and more Democratic with a small D. But the Electoral College is one of those vestiges that has not yet been abolished. I think it'd be hard to do because the states that have the benefit of an Electoral College would oppose it for civil. Small states. Okay, uh, there were some other people. Yes, sir. 
What's your assessment of Dr. Kavanaugh's situation that happened in D.C. recently? Uh, it seems like a year ago. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, the fast pace of events? Uh, I, I think the Kavanaugh issue is particularly relevant for the Waukesha County soccer moms. In other words, some of them might say, he was okay, she didn't have many facts, she didn't have much proof, they were libeling him, and so those soccer moms, the Waukesha County soccer moms, will feel comfortable voting Republican. On the other hand, if there's any population that would be unhappy about the Kavanaugh appointment and the Kavanaugh win, it would be soccer moms. Co white, college-educated, upper income, uh, who would feel that the voice of the woman was trumped by the voice of the man. And I'm not saying that as a... Uh, yeah. uh, so, who knows? Okay, I'm, I'm going to sweep backwards. Any, any more, any more, any more? Sir, I forgot one. Grover Cleveland. <laughs> he, won, he won a popular vote. He was the only guy. Yes, sir. His wife said to the White House staff, we'll be back. And by golly, they were. Yeah. He's, he's the only, this is good American tribute, good for you. The only American president who served two terms non consecutively. That's why when they talk about it, it's so interesting when they talk about the 39th president, the 38th president, is because nobody knows how to count Cleveland. <laughs> so by talking about the person who was president, by counting the presidents or the statues of presidents, that sort of resulted. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question about the ballot. Sure. I, I briefly looked at it online the other day. I always thought it was typical that the incumbent was listed first. Is that not? No. Accurate. Am I wrong that? My, my recollection of state elections law is that if there are uh, many names, or excuse me, the, in a general election there are parties. So there's a column for Republicans, there's a column for Democrats. I don't think the Wisconsin law identifies who the incumbent is. Okay. Um, so it's it's the party that, that wins the governorship is the party that gets the top slot on the ballot. Okay, so, so that's what I noticed. So if it, and, and the names okay. is by, by ballot draw, they draw numbers at the clerk's office to who's on the ballot, if, that's if, what they do. If there are multiple candidates in a primary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so let's say there's a Republican, there was a Republican primary for U.S. Senate. Well, who's <laughs> name got listed first? It, it was by a draw. <laughs> I remember when I, in my first race for the state assembly, uh, I, I just started going door to door. I was new at it. My name was such a conversation stopper. <laughs> uh, so I'm going door to door, and very early on, uh, I uh, rang a doorbell near Fonslack in Medford, and a woman answered the door, uh, was a homemaker. Um, we talked <coughs> for a few minutes. I gave her my spiel about my qualifications and my views and issues. And, uh, at the end of the conversation, she said, you know what, I've decided I'm going to vote for you. Now, this was thrilling, because up to that point, I only had my mother's vote. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then, then she said, and you know how I'm going to remember that I want to vote for you? And I'm, I'm absolutely baffled. I said, how? Ah. And she said, I'm going to go down the ballot until I get to the guy with the weird name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yes ma'am, and then... Uh, right, on the, back to the subject of the Electoral College. If we abolish the Electoral College, we would be dominated entirely by New York and California, the big states, Texas. Well, I, I think what we'd be dominated by would be media markets. In other words, if you're running for president, you want to get free media in Chicago. You want to get free media in New York, Philadelphia. I mean, I'm down the line in Florida, in Texas. But sooner or later, there'll be a presidential campaign that says, hey, we need to start going to the second tier markets because there are votes there. And we, I, whoever, could still get elected president if I can collect all the votes from the second tier markets. Let's go to Milwaukee. Let's go to 
What's the capital of Iowa? <laughs> 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 Des Moines. Des Moines. Let's go to Des Moines. Yeah. Let's go to Omaha. So I think uh, I think it would be based on the logic of campaigning. Okay. I, uh, yes, ma'am, and then this gentleman. And then we're past time. Your stomachs are probably rumbling. <laughs> Is there a chance that Citizens United will be reversed and if so how would that who would start what did she say? Citizens Gen United. Will Citizens United ever be reversed? Um, it, it could be reversed in two ways. One, if there's a law that passes. Because after all, this is a Supreme Court opinion that's interpreting the law. You, if you pass the law to change the wording of the law, you could have a de facto repeal of Citizens United. Now for that, you'd probably need to have a Democratic House and Democratic Senate and a Democratic President. But the people uh, that are funding it all are the lobbyists who... And then the only other way would be if there's a Democratic President and a Democratic Senate, if three or four Supreme Court justices drop dead. So what you're not having? No. I mean, it, it's possible. Um, Oh, it is. Yeah. Sir, you get the last word. What, what do you want to be the last word? What are your thoughts on term limits? You know, I, I've gone back and forth on term limits. On the one hand, I, I like the logic that because of incumbent advantage, that the only way to get incumbents out of office was to term limit them. So there were times when I was in the state legislature when I supported it. And then other times that I thought, <coughs> If we believe in democracy, if we believe in majority rule, then if the voters want to elect somebody until they're 105, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's democracy. So I really don't have a good answer for you. You know, the nice thing about democracy, democracy with a small d, is there's no such thing as the correct answer. And that can be frustrating at times, but I, I think it's the wonderful excitement of living in America. Thank you very much. of understanding of what is happening in the historical perspectives and so let's have one more